I want to give you a story of how at least I make sense of China, okay? So the way I want to start is that there's a sense in which I think China poses a real puzzle. And the puzzle is that if you think about you know, what a Chicago economist would say about what you need to generate 10% growth over 40 years, right? And, and, and you go down that list, right? China will have done none of them. And will have done you know, none, 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 uh, none of them. So I'll, I'll, I'll just give you one piece of evidence. So one way, one simple way to try to measure this is that the World Bank has, for the last 15 years now, they've done a survey of business practices. Okay, this is, this is the thing that they call their doing business survey. And basically what this is, is basically a macro version of the kind of exercise that Hernando de Soto was doing in Lima, Peru in, 1980, in, in 1985. Basically, you know, uh, going to firms and getting the firms to document what it took to do a number of basic <laughs> procedures that every, uh, that every business has to do. Okay, so this is how China does. In 2013, uh, if you look at how China ranks in terms of, the, uh, of, say, the ease of starting a business, China ranks 151 in the world. Okay? And there were 185 countries that were ranked by the World Bank in, in, in that year. And just so that you can have a benchmark of this, you know, Congo is just does a little bit worse. It's 152. Haiti does better. Uh, uh, the, I picked the, these two countries because these are the two countries that our dear president called the blank blank uh, countries of the world, all right? So now, I first want to just emphasize that there's something real that these numbers are measuring, okay? And in fact, the numbers were so real that when Wen Jiabao found out about how China was, was doing, he, he went through the roof. He, he went through the roof and he put tremendous amount of pressure on the World Bank to do something about this. And if you look since 2013, China has done much better. Uh, uh, has done much better on, on these rankings. But what I also want you to, to, to think about is that, well, but China is different, right? You know, we do not talk about Haiti. We do not talk about Congo in the same way. Nobody thinks about Haiti as the strategic threat to the U.S. Nobody talks about, you know, what Haitian businesses are doing. A joke that I tell my my MBA students is that, you know, the way that you want to think about whether a country is going to hell is, is to ask, has Angelina Jolie been to your country? And if Angelina Jolie has been to your country, your country is going to hell, okay? Uh, so Angelina Jolie has been, I mean, there's something to that. I mean, what country, I mean, what has to be there in the country for you to be willing to give up a substantial number of your kids for adoption? Uh, 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 adoption. So Angelina has not been to China. She's been to the Congo. She, 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 she has been to Haiti. So I'm just going to say that, that your China is not an Angelina jo, is not an I, it's not an Angelina Jolie con, uh, country. So how can we solve that? You know, you know, why is it different? So the way I want to get you the sense of what is different is to tell you about a visit that I made. Okay. So let me tell you about the visit. So this was in the, actually in the summer of 2013. So my collaborators and I, we went to this small city, small in China is two million people, okay? A small, a small city in southern China. We went to the city, so if I mention the name, you're not gonna know, you, 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 you're not gonna know the city. They, they know the city. There are hundreds of, of cities like this in, in, in China. We went to the city just because there was somebody that we knew in the city. The, you know, we knew the person that was the vice mayor of the education department in the city. Okay? We went to this person's office at 10 o'clock in the morning. This, the, the, the vice mayor was, was, was a student, was a former student at Tsinghua of one of my, co of one of my collaborators. We got there at 10 o'clock in the morning, and then we were met by this guy's chief of staff, and the chief of staff apologized, said that, you know, the the vice mayor was really looking forward to seeing you, but unfortunately, uh, unfortunately he has some important visitors in town. He's gonna try really hard to meet, uh, to meet with you, but so far, you know, I don't know when he's, when he's, gonna, he's gonna be able to, to meet with you. David's probably had lots of experiences like this. You know, the foreign minister is busy and we can't, can't meet, uh, meet you. But I think in this case, it was real, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what it was. So we started to talk with, with the chief of staff. And after about 20 minutes, it didn't really take that long. 
you know, about what the Vice Mayor's Office for Education does, the, the Chief of Staff proudly handed us this flowchart. And he said, this is what we do in the Vice Mayor's Office for Education, okay? So, and I'll give you my translation of, of what the flowchart says. Again, it's a Vice Mayor's Office for Education. So this is the part of, of, of the local government of this small city that was responsible for monitoring the teachers, running the schools, making sure the students are learning. Okay? But this is what they do, okay? They first, the part, first part of the flowchart is that they actively look for quality prospects. Prospects for what, okay? They have an initial discussion to learn about the investor. Invest, in, investor, invest in what, okay? They undertake a feasibility analysis. They identify land and other needed services, and whatever it is they're talking about goes for the approval of the vice mayor, and then they sign the agreement, okay? What, what is the vice mayor doing? What does this look like, okay? What you quickly find out, okay? And the, uh, we quickly find, find, find out is that what the vice mayor's office is really doing with his time is that this is actually, you know, it is what you think it is. That what he's doing with all of his time, with all of his political capital, is basically looking for investors in his city. Okay? He is really looking for quality prospects. They are meeting with in, in investors. So what you quickly find out is that what is really remarkable about every Chinese city is that all the, the entire focus of the political apparatus, think about it as the use of the Leninist Party state, the entire focus of, 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 of the political apparatus is to basically look for investors, make sure that the investors they have in the city get everything that they want to make the city work. So in, in a sense, to connect it back to the World Bank doing business indicators, what they're doing with all their time is that they're basically carving out special deals. They're carving out Amazon type deals for every single, for all the firms that, all, all the firms that, that, are, that, that are coming in, in the city. So that we spent the rest of our time in the city, we spent a week in, in, in this city, and we basically, we did two things. We conducted a time survey. We wanted to f uh, f figure out what the Communist Party boss are doing with their time. And we also just, you know, we wanted some data on how many firms get access to special deals. So let me just give you some sense of the structure of the city, okay? The number one guy in the city is the secretary of the Communist Party. The number two guy is the mayor. And one way in which you could tell you know, what the rank is, is you, you look at the license plate number of the card. The license plate of the party secretary is one, the mayor is two, uh, is two. <laughs> so if you ever go there, don't ever make the mistake of talking to the mayor first, because that's a breach of protocol, <laughs> right? And then underneath the mayor, there are nine vice mayors, and so one of the nine vice mayors is the one that we knew. But then he introduced us to the other nine, the nine mayors, so we spent our time talking. So our, our rough quantitative estimate is that each, nine, each, of, each of the nine vice mayors has about 20 companies. These are, just to be clear, these are not state-owned firms. Okay, state-owned firms are something else completely. These are 20 private companies that their job was to make sure that these 20 private companies get everything they need in order to make business work. Okay, so I'll give you one example. So that same night, the first night that we were there, at eight, at eight o'clock at night, the chief of staff took us out for dinner, and about 11 o'clock at night, the vice mayor finally shows up, and he says, you know, I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry, you know, this has been a really busy day. There were some important investors in town. What, what had happened was that there were three groups of, uh, there were three groups of investors that came to town, two from Hong Kong, one from Thai, and one from Taiwan, and he said, I had to have dinner with all three groups, so this is my fourth dinner tonight. <laughs> Uh, for dinner tonight, and he gets a call at midnight. Um, he stepped off, came back in five minutes, and he explained that you know one of his 20 companies was running into trouble getting an import license, and then we asked him what he did. He said, well, I called up the relevant person in the other part of the local government, and he agreed to carve out a special deal for, uh, so that the company doesn't need to get a license in order to import the, the, uh, in order to I I import the thing that, that he needs. And then we documented that back six o'clock in the morning, the guy was back in his office, so the guy was back. So the remarkable thing we can document, it's just the number, just the amount of hours that these, that these guys work, and the entire focus, at least in 2013, 
was about carving out these deals, carving out these Amazon type deals and making these businesses work. Okay, so the way that you want to think about this, this particular local government is that you have 180 companies and then we did not have access to the mayor and the party secretary, so we couldn't get the numbers, but people were saying that, that you know, that big guy, that big, that big important Taiwanese uh, company, that company is directly handled by the party boss. So rough guess is that about 1,200 companies, these are the largest companies, are, they, are, they basically have access to Amazon type deals. Okay, so this is the city with 2 million people, employment of about 800,000 people. So you have 200 companies, each one with employment of about 50, uh, the average employment is about 1,500. So in the city alone, you have say 300,000 workers work for firms in which they get everything they want. Okay, so those World Bank pesky rules, you know, those, 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 those rules and all these rules and regulations, it doesn't apply to these guys because they have a special deal. Hey, they have a special deal. So they have the Jeff Bezos uh, special helicopter pad. They, you know, they, 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 get, they get the tax breaks. These rules that apply to everybody else don't apply to these guys. So this is what the system is. Okay? So the system is one in, in which they're the formal rules, but everybody, un, everybody understands, unless you are like a new American business coming into town, I mean, th these are the people that I, I, I have found run into trouble, into trouble. But, but it, unless you are a brand new American company, you understand that these are the rules. And it's, 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 you, it's about working through the informal system. And it's, it's, and it's a well understood system in which you go and you make a deal with these guys. Okay? So let me explain, let me give, give you one story of how this plays out. Okay? So let me tell you about the car industry in China. And so that, and, and I, I like this example because it illustrates both the costs and the benefits of how this system works, okay? So the background to the car industry in China is that the predecessor of the equivalent of the China 2030 plan, uh, 2030 back in the 2000s was what the Chinese call the strategic and pillar industry policy. And what that policy was, was that in 14 industries, okay, only state-owned firms, a certain subset of state-owned firms was allowed to produce in these sectors. Okay? I think they had this crazy notion of that, you know, here were the pillar industries, and you wanted to create powerful state-owned firms in these in industries. Car was one of them. So only eight companies were allowed to make cars. Okay? One of these companies was this company called Shanghai Au, was this company called Shanghai Automobile Industrial Corporation. And what the Shanghai Automobile Industrial Corporation did is that in 2000 or 1999, they entered into a joint venture with General Motors. And General Motors now is the largest car producer in China. Okay? So let me tell you, start by start by telling you about, about Shanghai GM. Okay? It's a company, it's the largest car company in China. It's 50% owned by GM, 50% owned by the Shanghai Automobile Industrial Corporation. The Shanghai Automobile Industrial Corporation is a publicly listed firm, but 80% of it is owned by, this, by the holding company called the SAIC Group. And the SAIC Group is owned by the local government of the city of Shanghai, okay? That's the story. This is, this is a very typical state-owned firm, right? So it's not quite the old state-owned firm, it's this new, it's this, it's a new thing. There was a time in which the Chinese would joke that General Motors is a joint venture between the Communist Party of China and the U.S. Treasury uh, uh, until uh, two years ago. Or the other joke the Chinese would tell is that it's state-owned, GM is state-owned in China and state-owned in the U.S. Uh, uh, as well. It's another version of the same joke. All right? So let me just give you a sense of, of this company. The SAIC Motor Corporation, they also own 50% of this other company called Shanghai Volkswagen, which is the second largest car company in, in the US. I'm sure a bunch of you have been to Shanghai, right? Have you ever seen the taxis in Shanghai? Let me show you a picture, okay? This is the only taxi you're gonna see in Shanghai. What is it, right? It's a Volkswagen, why is that? They own it. They own it. So, there's no rule that says that you need to buy a Volkswagen, but if you run a cab company, you know what's good for your health, 
that you buy the car of the par, par, uh, party boss. I'm going to ask this to Dave. Taxis in Beijing. What? No, no but, but the only, the, the brand of car, uh, the brand of taxis. No, 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 the, the, uh, the, the, the company that makes the cars. Uh, Dave has been chauffeured around, all right? <laughs> so those of us that take cabs, cabs in Beijing, they're all Hyundais. Every single one of them is a Hyundai. You're not gonna see a single VW on the streets. Why is that? It's the same deal, right? There's a joint venture between the Beijing Auto Group and Hyundai, and if you're running a Beijing cab company, you know what's good for your health too, you know? And the same goes for Guangzhou. In Guangzhou, it's a Toyota. Uh, that's, what, that's what you're gonna see, okay? And it's only in cities that don't have a local firm, that's when you see the competition. That's where you see the competition. But, so this is one of the, the consequences of, of, of the system. You basically have every, so it, it's essentially one of the things that you get when you have when, when, when you have powerful political leaders in bed with businesses, right? Uh, and it's one of the things that we in Chicago say is really harmful for your health. So let me just say more about this, okay? And then the last thing is that the Shanghai Auto also runs a standalone car company, and the reason they want a joint venture, which is the subject of discussion now, is because they didn't have the foggiest idea of how to make cars, and they wanted the joint, the joint venture so that they would learn how to make a uh, they will learn how to make. Uh, they will learn how to make a car. So as part of the joint venture deal with with uh, with, with with the GM, what GM pressed for and they got was that GM was given monopoly rights over cars with engines greater than 2,500 uh, uh, cc. So GM wanted the monopoly power. Okay. So again, if you're running a company, monopoly is great. If you're a consumer, it's terrible. Uh, it's terrible, but GM wanted that and it got it. It, it got it got the exclusive right that they were they were only ones allowed to sell cars. But in exchange, there was a detailed agreement over the number of managers of SAIC, the number of engineers working in the R and D department that would have to also work for GM. What do you think SAIC wanted in exchange for the monopoly power? Right? They wanted the know how. Right? They wanted the right to be able to make a car. So if you're a GM, what do you do? You want the monopoly, okay? even if it's bad for the consumers, it's good for your stockholders. Right? You want the monopoly, but you also worry that this guy, your partner, is gonna steal, is gonna steal your intellectual property. It's the perennial problem. Right? So the way that GM solved this problem, the way that they did it, the, is that they said, all right, you know, we really want the monopoly power, so we cannot give up on the Chinese market. And the other thing is that, you know, if your partner says, no, 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 we're never gonna steal your intellectual property, and suppose that five years down the line they do, which court are you gonna sue them in? You, you are gonna sue them in the Shanghai court? Well, who appoint that judge? <laughs> it's the same guy that stole your property in the first place. Again, it's the local communist party, party, party boss. So, you know, there isn't the, there isn't the usual Protection. So GM's response I thought was rather ingenious. So the way that it was explained uh, to us is that look, okay, we know they're there, we know that they're gonna do this. So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna sell a car that that if they do what we think they're gonna do, nobody else in their sane mind would ever buy this car. Okay? <laughs> so this is what they did. This is what GM did. The, the, the first car they sold in China was this beauty, the Buick New Century. And so they started to sell, this was the very first car, you know, they created a brand new factory, and this is a car that had gone out of production in the US uh, 10, uh, uh, 10 years before, and it retailed in Shanghai for $44,000, okay? You know, so GM was, GM was rolling in the money. It was basically taking cars that nobody else wanted to buy and selling it, exploiting the monopoly power, the political power of its partner, which is the most powerful local government in China. Okay, and so it was doing extremely well. It was, it was, you know, it's doing, you know, so this is like a story that you could tell out of Latin America, you could tell the story out of Africa. This is why we think special deals are terrible. Okay, but what happened is that, so GM just wanted to try to continue the strategy. The second card is sold in China 
is that it took an old design from their German subsidiary, rebranded it as a GM car, and sold it in China for $33,000. So that's the beauty here. So I have a picture of the German car, the, G, uh, the, the, the Opel Corsa. I think that's East Germany, not West uh, Germany. And then that's the Chinese version of the car. Okay. Now, the really interesting part of the story is basically, in the third car, GM started to face competition. That they couldn't do what they wanted to do. So the third car that they started to sell in the Chinese market, they, took, they, they needed a slightly cheaper car. Okay? So they took the design from their bankrupt Korean subsidiary. So they took a design from Daewoo, okay? uh, rebranded it as a GM car, built up a brand new plant. And here's the amazing part of the story. Six months before they were ready to sell, another Chinese company had come onto the market selling exactly the same car. Okay? They were facing some competition from somewhere. Right? So here I have a picture of the car. So the picture of the, the car on the, on, on the, with, 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 the, with the Chevy logo, that's a GM car in China. It's, it's not a really, it's, it, it's a Daewoo car. And on the right is the copy. It's, it's the copy from another Chinese company. Okay? It's a, from another Chinese company. It's a company called Cherry. Okay? And the GM engineers would say that they went, you know, they were shocked when this happened. You know, how, how, could, they, how could somebody have done this? Uh, how could somebody have, have, have done this? They open up the car and they say, you know, somebody, they, had gotten, they had gotten hold of the same blueprints. They, they were, they, 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 you know, they, it, was a, it was exactly the same design. There's a little bit of an innovation, like the, the copy has a little bit of a smile, a little bit of a smile, the other one does, that does not. So let me just tell you a little bit about this company, Cherry, because that's an important part, I think, of what makes this system work. Okay, so think about what, what's, what, 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 what's going on, uh, the, the first part. GM was basically using a special deal to, uh, to and using a, a, a special deal, selling price, uh, cars, and, uh, uh, substandard cars at monopoly price, uh, prices. Cherry is a company that came out of nowhere. Okay, it's not based in Shanghai. Okay, it's based on this city called Wuhu, very similar to the city I described to you, city of two, of two million, two million people. Now it's a major center in the, in the automobile industry. Back then, it was nothing. It was none, none, uh, nothing. So the company was started by these two guys, by this guy called Mr. Yin and this guy that's a Wuhu vice mayor. It's a guy called Mr. Zhang. You know, similar political rank to the guy that I was describing to you. The story of Mr. Yin, who is the, uh, you know, the entrepreneur and the guy who started, who started the company, is that he, he started his career working for a state-owned firm called First Auto Works, and he worked in the city of uh, Chang. He worked in the city of Chang, of uh, Changchun. The First Auto Works entered into a joint venture with Volkswagen, and Volkswagen said, "Well, our contribution to this joint deal is that you could pick any one of these ten plants that we are no longer using and use that as our contribution to the joint venture." So. Mr. Yin would describe to us how he, he went and looked at all these plants and he thought the best plant was VW Westmoreland, which is right outside of Pittsburgh. So he, he then spent the next two years basically looking at the design of that VW plant in P Pittsburgh and basically assembling it into crates and relocating that plant to northern China. Took it apart and he started to make basically a VW car, okay? So think about this process. He learned about how to actually set up a factory line, how to get the supplier. So you know all the pieces that you need in order to make a car company work. Okay. After he did this, he said, you know, I saw that the world was changing, and I want you know, I have all these skills, and I wanted to create something of my own. But think about his dilemma. You know, you say, you know, you know, I know how to create a car company. I just need a couple billion dollars. Will you help me? In most other places of the world, you know, you should just think, you, you should just uh, uh, stop that thought, you know, right at the inception. But in China at this time, in the late 1990s, there was a very clear path, okay? 
So in the same way that you know, if you if you have an idea for a new internet venture, you know, you walk down sand, or you drive down Sand Hill Road, or you walk, you drive down wherever you want to go to, and you know what the path is, what you have to do. Same way here, you basically you basically go knocking on the doors of local Communist Party bosses, and what he said is that you know, ten of them gave me offers. Again, it's like the Amazon thing. You know, they all wanted this. They thought uh, they wanted this. So he struck a deal with this guy that was a, the, the vice mayor of the city of Wuhu. So this is the way that he describes the deal that they had. He said, the vice mayor told him, you let me take care of the politics. You just focus on getting some cars built here. And I find that a really remarkable statement because what this guy is saying is that, look, I don't have the foggiest idea how to make a car. You do, okay? So you take care of that, okay? But I know the politics. I can get you the permits, and the main part of the, and then we can make a deal, and both of us will be better off. What were the politics? The main part of the politics was basically the Chinese strategic, uh, the, the uh, strategic industrial policy, and the main problem was that what, what Cherry wanted to do was illegal. It was not one of the authorized firms. So what these two guys would say is that we went to the NDRC and he said, you know, can we get a permit to make cars? The, the vice mayor was, he said, I was naive when I started the, this out. The answer came back quickly, don't even think about it. No way in hell. You are, not part of the, you are not part of the plan. You cannot build a car. The guy got wiser and he said, okay, fine. We know we're not allowed to make cars, but car engines were not under the license. You know, it's not part of, it's, an engine is not part of the strategic industry, so they got a license to make a car engine. So the, with that license, they went and they bought an old Ford engine plant in the UK, disassembled it, took it to China, started to roll out engines. They went to the NDRC again, and they said, well, you know, we now have a company where, where we're, we're giving good jobs to 5,000 people, we're making great engines, we just need some cars to put these things in, uh, <laughs> into. What about the following deal? The deal is that you give us a license, but we promise, and this deal is, the license is a limited one, that we can only sell the car in our city, okay? And you can see why that deal would work. Because that's, if you can only sell in your, in your city, you know, GM is not threatened. It doesn't threaten their monopoly rights. Okay? So they got that limited license, okay? and they went to the license, and they went and they looked, shopped around for a plant. This time they found a plant uh, in, an, in, in, in Spain. This is the old plant run by, v, by, by, uh, v, by, v, by VW. It's an old plant for those of you who know the city of Barcelona. It's an old plant right north of the uh, airport of, Bar, of, uh, Bar, of uh, Barcelona. So there's an industrial district right north of Barcelona. They, and you know, this is something the guy knew well. He knows VW plants. He disassembled it, took it to China, started to roll out copies of the, of, of, of the VW. So I have a picture of their first car. So the first car, they call it the Cherry Feng Yen, which is the wind, Cherry wind, wind and the Rain. Wind and the Rain, and next to the VW Jetta, which is, is a copy. But, they, but, the, they were, but they were going bankrupt really quickly because it's a small city, right? And they were selling you know, 2,000 cars every year. They had already forced all the taxi companies to buy their car. It's a small, it's a small city. It's a, li, a, li, uh, it's a very limited uh, market. So he, the guy would say that in desperation, they went to, the guy went to his political patron in the central government, and his, and his political patron came up with the following deal. So the deal that they had is that they went to Shanghai Auto and they said, look, we have a promising company. Why don't you take a 20% equity stake in this company and we won't charge you. You can have the 20% equity stake for free. Okay? Now, what the, what the negotiation was, I don't know. But in 2000, Cherry became registered as 20% owned by SAIC, okay? So then the guys at Cherry, they took the new registration to the NDRC, and they said, look, we are no longer Cherry. We are, we are a subsidiary of Shanghai Auto. Shanghai Auto is part, of the, is part of the plant, so we should have the same rights as Shanghai Auto. So that got them the full license. That got them the full license to make it to, to make a car. So the second car was a clone 
of the, the clone of the, the GM cars. It, it, took the, it took the guys at GM two years to figure this out. Uh, so first, you know, they thought that it was some other company, and it took them two years to, to figure out that this other company was 20% owned by their partner. And then after three years, Cherry bought back the 20%, uh, 20, 20, it bought back the 20% uh, 20% uh, 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 20% equity stake. So let me just summarize Cherry. Cherry is actually legally registered as a state-owned firm. Okay? It's legally registered as a state-owned firm. The Wuhu, the, the ownership structure is that the Wuhu local government owns the majority stake, and then the other 45% is owned by 10 different holding companies. The 10 holding companies itself are owned by other whole, whole uh, 10 other whole holding companies. So I'm going to say that basically 55% is owned by the city and 45% is owned by people that is, are really hard to identify. Uh, and that is the typical structure. So since it's more than 50% owned by the local government, it's registered as a state-owned firm. And what you see now is that Cherry is the largest exporter of cars from China. Now you think about why they export, that basically they find their market in Shanghai blocked. They find their access to the market in Beijing blocked, okay? Where they don't find their market blocked is that they go to Honduras, they go to El Salvador, they go to Venezuela, they go to Peru, they go to, uh, they go to uh, Ecuador. There, they compete, on the, uh, they compete on the level per playing field, okay? But in, but, in, but in Shanghai, they can't do it because they're up against this powerful, uh, powerful local incumbent firm. And, and Shanghai GM is the largest company, largest car manufacturer in China, and it exports nothing. Again, you know, who's going to buy the Buick New Century? Uh, um, so let me just finish a story that a year ago, I was in a small town of Villa Vicencio in Colombia, and the cars you saw on the streets of Colombia were the Korean cars and the cherry cars. The cherry cars. So this was a cherry van. This, this was the van. It sold for about $9,000. It doesn't sell in the U.S. because there is no market for, for these cars in the, in the U.S., but this was a car right in front of a house of a baker. So this is the kind of car. Uh, so Cherry is one of the major exporters of cars in the US. So let me just give me one more minute and I'll just summarize it. Um, here's, let, uh, let me give you two quotes. I, I think summarizes the system well, okay? This is a quote from somebody who runs a business. And this is the way that he understands the system. Each locality operates like a standalone company Localities prompt investments, strong arms banks for finance, and often hold shares in the businesses themselves. In the case of Cherry, that's what you saw. They operate much like a company might. At the same time, the local party's overwhelming powers within its own borders make each district its own separate jurisdiction with direct control over the courts and over regulations governing business, uh, uh, over, uh, business activities. And the other quote I have is, is just a, 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 a quote from a car analyst when he's talking about General Motors in, in Shanghai, he, the way that he describes it is that the commercial goal of selling more GM Buicks and Chevrolets in China becomes a political and economic campaign to enhance the power and might of the city of Shanghai. Think of it as Shanghai Inc. with the Communist Party Secretary as the Chairman and the CEO. Okay? This is incomplete because it's not, just, it's not just Shanghai Inc., but there's Beijing Inc., there's Guangzhou Inc., there is Dalian Inc., there is Wuhu Inc., and that's where a lot of the competition has, a lot of the competition has come from. Okay? So I'm gonna submit that this is the system that emerged since 1989, and we can talk about how this system may have changed in the last five or so years. Okay? So I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna get Dave to come up. How should we start? I was thinking to starting with a thought experiment. Okay. If that's okay. You will be Chiang Tai Xie, and I will be Liu He, the vice premier in charge of economic matters. He was just here, and I think he just left uh, this morning. But I want you to explain why all of what you just said is a bad thing. In the context of, look, for the last 40 years, as the system has uh, evolved, China's been the fastest growing economy in the world. Uh, it has lifted hundreds of millions of people from poverty. So, 
So why, why is this a bad thing? Why should I be worried about what you're telling me? Number one, the system, what, what, what I did not say is, what do you need for the system to work? So the fundamental thing about this system is that it fundamentally depends on the discretion of local party officials. That, that I mean, that's, that's the essence of the regime of special deals. Right, uh, re re regime of special deals. Then the question you have to ask is, what are the consequences of needing the discretion of local party officials? And what is it that motivates uh, these guys to work investment banking hours? Because that's, that's, that's what we documented. Okay? And there are basically two narratives out there. I will say that the official Chinese narrative is that these guys do this because of the love of the country and love of the party. That's the view of the organization department of the Communist Party. That you know, this is the patriotic thing to do. Okay? Now, the question is, okay, what if you're 60 years old, you're the, you're the vice mayor of this obscure city, you know your chances of getting promoted are zero, and you have this enormous political power, yet you're still doing this, why? <laughs> You're, you're still, you're still, because you see this up and down the system. You see this up and down the, the system. And a lot of this, I think a huge part of it is that until about 2014 or so, there were very, very few constraints on the kind of deals that you could strike. You, it was very easy to get private benefits from doing this. So the question you want to think of, if it's private benefits that are driving this, then um, what are the consequences of private benefits, of, 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 of private, I mean, uh, of, of having private benefits. The second cause of this is that, you know, you also have to think about the firms that are left out of the system. So in the case of the city that I did, I, a city that I described, there were 200 companies. What about the other 50,000, uh, uh, the other 50,000 companies that are out, out of the system? Uh, they suffer, and on net, it's been the case that the, win that the gains to the winners outweigh the losses to the losers, but what if you wanted to move to a different system? You wanted to move to a system where you don't need these special deals. You don't need these special deals. Well, this kind of, uh, it, the fact that you have this, I think makes it really hard because the system, you know, if, if, if you think about the interest, the powerful interest that this system generates, um, the powerful businesses, the, the most successful businesses, they don't want the system to change because they benefit, they have the deal, nobody else has the, the deals. Right. The, for, for the Communist Party bosses, this is a great system because everybody needs them, right? Everybody needs them. What they, what they don't want is to be like the mayor of, the mayor of Austin, where, where you don't need to know the guy, <laughs> all right? You don't need it because it's not crucial for, for your life. So you are unimportant. Whereas if you're the Communist Party boss of any Chinese city, you know, they are the key person. They matter. Okay? You need them to get anything done, okay? So they are our, our, our power. So you have the most powerful people who stand to lose if you want to move to a system that could potentially make your economy better off. So it, 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 I think the, the system basically gets China stuck in, in, in a place that's really, really hard to move from. Uh, so in, in, in the mid-90s when I was in Beijing, we used to joke that the Communist Party was the world's largest Elks Club. Right, that people joined so they, as a networking occasion to get together to do exactly the sorts of, of uh, 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 deals that you've you've talked about, but just now you alluded to 2014 and when things started yeah. changing. And I presume you mean Xi Jinping's anti-corruption anti campaign. Corruption campaign. And is that changing? Is it closing down the Elks Club? And is it undermining? The completely. No, co completely. So what I've seen now is that every year I go back, the kind of deals that I saw would take place really easily. So I, I'm going to say that the system I, I described is still this, this is still this is still the system. What is different now is that it used, to be the, it used to be possible for anybody to get into the system. So sometimes I'm going to use a Chicago term that, that it's not just a system of special deals, but it's a system where there's free entry into being a special deal. That you don't need to be, I don't need to be your cousin, I don't need to, I don't need to be your best friend, I don't need to have gone to the same social club with you, I don't need to golf with you, I don't need to golf with, with, with you. If I have a good plan and if I have a reputation, I can make a deal. Okay? Anybody can do it. It can be the Foxcom guy. It can be a small sneaker manufacturer. 
anybody can make a deal happen. The only thing that differs is whether I have access to the provincial boss or whether I have, I have access to the vice mayor or if I'm a really tiny sneaker company, I have access to the chief of staff, right? It's just these different layers, uh, different layers. What I see now that is different is that it's the smaller guys that are being freezed out of the system. The Foxcom guy can still make the deals, uh, can still make, can still, uh, uh, can still make, make the deals happen. Now, if you think about the story, if you think that the reason that these guys do this is because they have access to private benefits, you shut down their access to private benefits, they stop making these deals, and if you need these deals in order to make the economy grow, what's the consequence? The economy is going to stop growing, and what have we seen in terms of GDP growth? You know, there's been a slowdown of four to five per, four to five percent of of uh, for, uh, four to five per for four to five percent of GDP, and I think that that number actually understates the 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 actual declining growth. If for those of you who are interested, I'm presenting presenting another paper at the Brookings panel in a few weeks, where we go through the Chinese national accounts, and we and we document that that we basically reestimate the numbers of GDP growth, and it's actually about two percent lower since 2008 than what it actually is, what the official accounts. Uh, so the answer is that is that you shut down corruption under for under regime of special uh, regime of special deals, then uh, and then what's going to happen to growth is that it's going to fall. Uh, and that's what's happening. That's what has has happened. Uh, so maybe a story I'm going to give you is that there's this famous picture that is seared in the memory of lots of people in Asia. Since I'm, I'm at the IMF, I'm going to mention it. There's this famous picture of Kam De Su with his arms uh, crossed with a stern look, looking over the shoulders of President Suharto of Indonesia. Uh, Suharto signed <laughs> that law uh, in which he closed the banks that were owned by his sons, right? And the idea was that, look, you know, Indonesia had ran into trouble because of the system of cronyism, very much like the, it's like, it's like the Chinese system, but a, 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 but, a, but, a, but a small scale version. It's like a baby version of the Chinese system. And the idea was that you know you want to shut down the corruption, and then you're going to get a new regime where you no longer have to make these payoffs in order to make 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 make, make it work. There's a story that an Indonesian businessman told me. It's one of the in the, the ethnic Chinese Indonesian businessmen. I asked him what was going on through your mind when you saw this. When you saw this, he said, "I was terrified." I said, "Suharto is so weak that he cannot even protect his son. How is he going to protect my property?" What he meant by that is that the way his property was protected was that he, had, he also had a bunch of these deals, right? So he said, since, since I know my property is no longer going to be protected because this guy is politically weak, I took all my money and I took all my money and I moved it to Singapore. Uh, and what was the aftermath of that action? I mean, Indonesia went through seven years of negative GDP growth. I mean, you know, uh, uh, um, so. You know, whether that's causal, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know, in the same case with China, whether the decline in growth is, is causal, but I think it's certainly suggestive. So, so what's your list of, of reforms or advice now that you have Liu He to, to offer advi advice to? What, what would you say uh, recommendations to get from where they are today to where China needs to be? You know, Dave, I honestly don't know. Here's the tension, right? Here's the, the tension is, is, do I want to hope for the best, but in, in, yeah, but, 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 but in that process, I avoid getting the good. That's, I mean, and, and, and I think that's, that, that's, the, the, that's the tension that I think lots of, lots of uh, countries have. Uh, um, there's this guy, some of you may know, this guy called Santiago Levy, uh, who used to run the Inter-American Development Bank. And he, he has this really apt phrase for his story of what's happened in Latin America. So he says that the story of Latin America is that they, they think that they are Bismarck, but it turns out that they really live in Macondo. Uh, so those of you who know the story of Guy So what he meant by, by that is that what Latin America has done is that it's looked at the world for the first for the, for the for the what seems to be the first best institutions, grafted them onto their their context, and realized after decades that it doesn't work the same way, right? It doesn't it doesn't work the, the same way. 
So he was specifically, Santiago was specifically talking about the, the Mexican social security system. That he was telling the story about how they had copied the German system and he realized that you know, they weren't Bismarck, that they, they were Mexico and things don't work quite work quite, quite work. So I don't really know the answer to that question. It, uh, it's, it's whether, you know, in the hope of getting into something better, in, in, into something that could be much better, you're gonna end up destroying what you have. So I... Uh, okay, I'll give you one more chance to offer advice. Since you're in Washington, uh, the, the sorts of reforms that the Trump administration uh, was pushing Liu He to, to implement, or the Chinese system to implement as part of the trade negotiations, what of those are, are simply unattainable? Are they all unattainable? Are there any things that, that you would, you would uh, that seem more doable than others based on your experience back in China? Certainly the trade surplus is, uh, is attainable. And, but it, I think it's attainable through non-market means. Uh, intellectual property, here's my view of, of, the, of the issue of in, intellectual property. It's basically one of, one of the consequences of having a system where they are, there's no legal protection of anything. <laughs> there's no legal, so it's not, so the way that I see this, it's not just American companies, it's what, it's what happens to the Chinese companies uh, themselves. So what they do to each other, what, what I see them doing to each other is just far, far more than what they do to American uh, to, to companies in the U.S. So one way in which you can see this is that if you look at the history of, the, of, of say, the powerful Chinese internet companies now, in terms of you know, how viciously competitive they are with each other, it is nothing like what they do. It, it's, it's just, it, it's an order of magnitude larger than what they do to American companies. What they do to American companies, they have to be a lot more careful because you know, Dave is gonna get on their case. <laughs> it's, gonna get, it's gonna get on their case uh, if, if, uh, if, they, uh, if, if they, they do something. So, so the bottom line is that the true reform, I just don't think it is, I, I don't think it is attainable. They can do cosmetic stuff, and they, they probably, my guess, my guess, guess of what a deal is gonna be, is that they're gonna carve out an exemption for American companies. So they're gonna say, we're gonna protect intellectual property only for you. <laughs> so they're very good at that. Uh, they're very good at carving out special deals, but fundamentally, it's not gonna change the way that the system works. I think I probably got time for one more question uh, before I turn to the audience uh, to ask. So, so prepare your questions, and I think Kara in the back has a microphone will come around. But, but let me move away from China just a little bit, to, to, uh, because I spent a number of years in working in and on Afghan issues, where corruption yeah. was almost entirely a negative yeah. uh, phenomenon. Right. That that, uh, that the rapacity of local officials. Yeah. Uh, 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 just seemed different from the, the kinds of uh, uh, yeah. corruption you saw in China. And, and is, there, is it a cultural factor? Is it, is it just different types of corruption? It's a different type of So the way that I would describe the Chinese corruption, or like, I mean, I, I grew up in Latin America, so that's a place I know well. And the difference, what I see, is that Chinese corruption is, or is about you extract rents after you create wealth. Uh, after you create wealth, so uh, as opposed to, you know, ex you 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 as opposed to just extracting the the extracting the rents. That is, you extract the rents after you allow GM to make some money. After you, so it's, it's only when they make money that you can extract your rents. And then the most the most typical way for this, I'm going to say, for these rents to take place is through these hidden ownership stakes. So what that does is that, if you think about what that does, is that it perfectly aligns the it perfectly aligns the incentives. You make money, I make money. You don't make money, I don't make money. I don't make money. So what is it that I see about the Chinese system that is different in which that such a, it takes its form? I would say one big thing is I don't know about Afghanistan. I, I don't know anything about Afghanistan, but a lot of the places that I see is that the first thing that is different is about the underlying. I'm going to say the, the state capacity, uh, the state capacity. So one thing that never ceases to amaze me about the Chinese state, 
okay, the Chinese at all levels, is that it fundamentally is a very strong Leninist state. Okay? And what I mean by that is that it's a state that penetrates all, and it's not the state, it's the party that penetrates all sectors of society, and it controls it, it has its tentacles in every sector of society. What that implies is that when they decide to do something, they can do it. They, they can do it. So sometimes, you know, I won't mention the history of China, they can use that power for really terrible things. You know, you want 50 million people dead? Done. Uh, 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 it, you know, uh, that's, you know, that's, if you think about the ability to implement the Great Leap Forward and all of the consequences, you know, any government with that ab ability, I mean, it's, it's, uh, and, and the thing that is remarkable in the last 30 years is that that same capacity of the Leninist state has been, has been pushed to work, to serve the purposes, to serve the profits of private businesses. Okay? So what that implies is that when they say they're going to make things happen, okay, they have the ability to do so, and they have a command structure. That it's like the IMF or the Army or the Army. They execute. Right? They execute. They have the ability to make, make that done. I don't know about, uh, I don't know about Af uh, Afghanistan, but my guess is that the authority <laughs> of the pre president of Aga Afghanistan does not, go, does not go beyond his yard. Uh, 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 that, that would be my guess. I mean, that, that's what I see in many other countries in the world. So if you don't have that ability, if you don't have the ability to create wealth, then what you do is that you just, you know, then you do, then you, then you, then you, you if you don't have the ability to create wealth, then you just steal. Uh, you're a hunter-gatherer rather than a farmer. No, that, that's right. That's right. You, you, you're just a hunter-gatherer. You, you have no ability to farm. The second part of the Chinese system I think has been really crucial is the enormous amount of competition that is in the system that it's not just President Karzai or, or whomever else, that it's not just this one guy. There are 3,000 of these guys. There are 3,000 of these guys. So if you don't, if one, one guy is screwing you, you just say, screw you, I'll move next door. And you have no authority next door. You have no authority. So it's a tremendously competitive system. And it's not just you know, there, but it's also at every single layer of government. There's a tremendous amount of competition at all, all, all the layers. Of government. I think that's, those are really the two things that make a difference. So again, you want to be careful that, you know, I want to be careful and say that you don't want to graft the Chinese system onto any other place because it's going to end up very differently in a place that doesn't have the same, the same decentralized system of competition and a system that doesn't have the same Leninist party structure state. Cheng, uh, we could talk all night, but if we talk much longer, you will miss your flight back to Chicago. All right. Dan. So I should uh, let you go. But on behalf of BFI and, 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 all right, and thanks. Washington, thank great. you for coming. Uh, and let's give a... Okay. Uh,